Well, thank, thank you for having me, uh, Michael. It was it was great to hear more about uh, work broad. I think uh, uh, pride is is absolutely uh, essential to an organization succeeding. So <clears throat> I, I'm I'm pleased to be with you, and and I, I, I'll I'll talk a little bit about the. Uh, the book. The book is is about models uh, and uh, and models and and you <laughs> and and uh, it turns out every time we kind of think about something, make a decision, uh, we use a model of of some sort. Um, and this for the uh, nerdy people, I just put them generically. Uh, this is the Black Scholes option pricing model, right? It's the way it's a model if you want to price options uh, that you use. And what I like to see is you owning your model. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is the model performs for you the service that you want it to do. In this case, it accurately prices a a uh, uh, an option. So that's a model that helps you do your business, whatever you're trying uh, trying to do. What I don't want to see happen is for your model uh, to own you, right? For for uh, you to use a model, it doesn't work, right? But you keep using it anyway. That's when your model owns you. And what I've seen out in the world of business is that models don't have to work for us to keep using them. And so I see lots of managers owned by their models. And what I'd like to convince you to do is to rethink those models and say, rather than trying to improve that model, how do you make, how do you make a shift to a better model that actually accomplishes uh, what you want? So I just picked three of the 14, uh, there's 14 chapters in the book on, yeah, on each model. So I just picked three uh, to talk through. I'm happy to talk for those of you who've already read the book, uh, other, other ones if, if uh, you so desire. But let's look at talent. In my view, the dominant model for talent that's out there in the world now is that the way to attract and retain talent is by paying them at a high rate that is consistent with talent. And we spend a lot of time designing the pay. Oh, what base salary is appropriate? What kind of annual bonus? And then what kind of structure do we have to have to that? What sort of short-term uh, you know, incentive plans do we have to put in place? Long-term incentive, incentive uh, uh, plans. And that notwithstanding, right? one of the big challenges of companies is is attracting talent and retaining and motivating uh, talent. So why do we keep uh, thinking that the way to the the way to uh, uh, attract and retain models is through working this angle? What I believe is the case is that feeling special is more important to talent than compensation. Now, notice I don't say that compensation isn't important. They have to feel that the compensation ha has fairness. But talent, right? Talent has worked hard to be, to build up a set of unique skills and capabilities. And when you treat talent as part of a class, you know, whether it's an exalted class, like the class of EVPs, or a, a kind of lower level of the organization, a less exalted class, like you know, uh, frontline customer uh, service reps, it doesn't matter. Nobody wants to be treated as part of a class. They want to be treated as, as something uh, special. And I learned this the hard way at the consulting firm that, uh, that I built with, uh, with friends when a guy named Giles, uh, came to me. He was one of our global account managers, which was the highest level in the, in the uh, organization. There were only about a dozen of them. And he came and asked uh, asked for parental leave. And this was 25 years ago now. So uh, parental leave for for the fathers was not was not a common common thing, not an automatic uh, thing in those days. And he, he came and said he wanted to discuss discuss that. And my answer to him was Giles. You're a, a global account manager. You're a senior person. Um, uh, you know that that's that's okay. Uh, you can kind of almost do whatever do whatever you want. And he was kind of sullen when I when I told him that. 
which surprised me because I'd given him exactly what he wanted. I didn't argue and say, well, you know, you'll have to take a compensation hit for that, or I'll have to check with the other partners uh, whether they think that's, uh, that's okay or not. I gave him exactly what he wanted, um, I thought. But what he actually wanted was not to be treated as a member of a class. So because he's a game, that's, he, he can do that. What he wanted was to feel special. And what he wanted me to say, I realized uh, kind of later, was, Giles, if that's really important to you, right? If that one thing is right now the most important to you in the situation you're, you're in, in, in your life, we want to make sure you do what you want to do. That would have made him feel special, unique, not as a member of, in this case, an exalted uh, class. So what are the things that helps people uh, feel special? I would argue there are three things. One, if you want to attract and retain talent, never dismiss their ideas. Right? When they, they think hard and work hard, and if they've thought about something and they've worked hard at it, they object enormously to having their ideas uh, dismissed. This is like Tony Ewan, the, the founder of Zoom, what we're working on. Um, he was, as, as, as most people know, he was the head engineer of WebEx for Cisco and said to Cisco, uh, you know, we've got to re-architect re, uh, this software, which he was part of, uh, of creating. Uh, but he said, uh, things are going mobile. Uh, our, our WebEx works terribly on a uh, mobile uh, platform. It's de as a desktop uh, a service. We need to re-platform it so that it works equally well on mobile. And they just said, no, right? That would cost too much money. We don't really want to do that. And so his idea was dismissed. And he responded the way talent responds, which is, if my idea is dismissed, I'm going to go and carry out my idea elsewhere, right? And now WebEx, you know, has got Cisco has got a competitor in Zoom that has vaulted far past them, and they probably will never recover their position. But they could have if they would have just understood that are the rules of of managing talent. Number two rule is never block their development. And this, the, that, that story is, is, is in part a story of dismissing ideas and part of blocking development. That's what Ewan wanted to do. That's the, the next stage uh, of, of what he thought needs to be done. And that was blocked. And so we went uh, elsewhere. The third one is somewhat counterintuitive, which is never pass up the chance to praise them, right? Often talent uh, it looks like they're succeeding to such a level that, that people just think, well, they don't need to be told they're doing well. They know they're doing well, you know, not, not the case, not the case, uh, at all. Um, they've worked as hard as possible to make themselves uniquely valuable and they want to be recognized, uh, for that. Uh, do you have to praise them every day? <laughs> you don't know, but don't pass up a chance to praise them uh, when you can. Um, now for football fans uh, uh, out there, there is a great illustration of, of, of all of this in the past, the past year with, uh, with Aaron Rodgers or past about 18 months with Aaron Rodgers, one of the greatest quarterbacks of, of his generation, a, a, sure, a sure Hall of Famer, multiple times MVP. But last summer, for the first time in his long career, long and illustrious career at Green Bay, he uh, he uh, uh, skipped most of of training camp uh, activities uh, and um, uh, and talked about retiring. Talked about asking to be uh, uh, well, hinting around wanting to be traded. He never came came right out and, and said. It. Why was that the case? Was it because they didn't pay him enough? Answer was no. In his last, both of his last two contracts, he set the new bar for the highest uh, pay in the in the entire NFL. But whenever he made comments to management about what he thought would be great for the for the company uh, 
uh, for the company, for the team to, to do in terms of the offensive weapons they needed, the, the uh, uh, wide receivers, running backs, et cetera. His ideas were just dismissed out of hand. Um, and so no amount of money could keep this talent, right, at the Green Bay, Bay Packers when his ideas were being uh, uh, dismissed. Uh, and he ended up shortening his contract by one year, as I say, missing a whole bunch of activities that he normally uh, uh, would do. Um, and and at the end of the year, saying he was he was uh, uh, reassessing his his future with the with the team, until they finally woke up and realized it wasn't money that was the problem; it was the treating treating him as special. Uh, and they started listening to him on on uh, and brought back his favorite receiver, Randall Cobb, et cetera. And he ended up re-signing uh, with, uh, with Green Bay. But only when they changed their talent model from saying, I'll treat you generically, but I'll just pay you so much that you'll be happy to be here. Doesn't work that way. So that's, that's a different way of thinking about talent. But uh, Another, another model that we have in our minds is the model of the corporation. The general model of the corporation is that the corporation is there for control and coordination, right? So, so if you've got a corporation that's got groups and business units, and this may be a medium-sized, even medium-sized companies tend to, tend to have, uh, have be split into chunks uh, like this. It might be instead of a littler company, it might be individual products and then, and then sort of, you know, kind of business units. But the dominant model of the corporation is the job of the top is to set strategy. And this, for those of you who haven't re read my playing to win book is my way of thinking about, about strategy, but is to set strategy at the top of the corporation. Right. And then it's to make sure to control and coordinate and make sure everybody below is, is doing what they're supposed to uh, below. I think this is a crummy model of the corporation that causes a whole lot of the problems in the modern corporation. Kind of one, <clears throat> all those businesses down below have to make strategy as well. They have to make strategy uh, choices. If the top is is Procter and Gamble and the group is beauty care uh, and under beauty care, there's hair care and under hair care, there's Pantene and head and shoulders. Pantene head and shoulders have to make strategy decisions. They don't, they don't just do what the, the corporation uh, uh, says. They've got to make strategy decisions to win against customers uh, uh, at the bottom of the, of the corporation. So a Pantene customer, a hair care customer, is not going to say, oh, I'm going to buy Procter & Gamble. They're going to say, I'm going to buy Pantene or not. Just like a, a bottled water uh, a customer doesn't say, oh, gee, should I buy the Coca-Cola product or the PepsiCo product? They say, should I buy Dasani or should I buy Aquafina? So the dominant model of the corporation that says it's, it's about we control and coordinate you, I believe isn't isn't as helpful as a model that says, no, our job is to assist that front line, what I call the coal face, Coca-Cola has got to assist Dasani in winning against Aquafina. Procter & Gamble has got to assist head and shoulders competing against Selson uh, Blue or Pantene competing against, uh, against Fructus. It's assisting the, the coal face where actual competitive decisions and, and buyer decisions are made is, is what's going to make sure that the company is as competitive as possible and isn't, and the people at the coal face aren't spending their time having their decisions controlled and coordinated, spending their time in reviews, up the up the corporation to make sure that the the corporation is is uh, um, satisfied that they are sufficiently controlled. Right. So a better model of the corporation is actually that everybody does strategy, and and the organ the organizations above 
the cool face play a role in helping those businesses compete. So for Procter & Gamble, if Procter & Gamble is big enough and advertises enough that, that Pantene can buy advertising at a cheaper price than its competitors, fructose, et cetera, can, or Selsun Blue for head and, head and shoulders, then Procter & Gamble is assisting uh, them. If they have uh, relationships, their their uh, their customer teams that they've set up. They've got 800 people at, in Bentonville, Arkansas, uh, at, at Walmart headquarters that can help sell in the, the, the annual program that Pantene wants to have in, in the store. Then they've helped the company and Pantene is better off being part of, of Procter & Gamble than, than separate. Um, so the better model of the corporation is a model that says the 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 key is what happens at the coal face and the rest of the company has to assist. But of course, the best model of the corporation is it flows both ways, right? Which is the corporation has to figure out what businesses it can help and have those in the portfolio and the ones that can't help and have and 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 punt those out of the portfolio. So there's a top down and a bottom up rather than rather than this strict uh, we make strategy at the top. Right, this this very strict. We make strategy at the top, and we're going to c- control and coordinate you. That is not a helpful view, and that is why so many companies are being broken apart by the capital markets because the capital markets see that it isn't helpful at all uh, for for uh, corporations. So that's that's a second model. The third model, third and last, and then then I'd love to love to hear your thoughts and questions. Is the dominant model for decisions in the modern uh, economy uh, says that decisions need to be made on the basis of rigorous data analytics. We've got to look at the data, determine what the data say, and uh, and uh, make a decision accordingly. It is interesting to me that there's a paradox that has come, I would argue, in the same time, at the same time, this feeling that all decisions have to be database has happened. And that's executive frustration with the level and pace of innovation. When I talk to the executives that I work with and ask them what frustrates them more than anything else, it would be this level and pace of innovation in their organization. Um, Despite that, right, it's the golden age for disruptive startups. Right. So how can both of these both of these happen? And I believe it's it's happened because of of this model of decisions made on on analysis. And the uh, challenge with data is if you look at data and ask the, ask the question over over t- over time, where we break time into the past. Time t equals zero, which is exactly when we are uh, analyzing the data. Right? So, if we're going to use d- uh, data to make analytics to make decisions, there's a point in the time where we're analyzing the data, um, and and then there's the future. and And what's the challenge? The challenge is this: hundred percent of all data on the face of the planet is from the past at the time you're doing the analysis. There is no data about the uh, future. You cannot analyze data about the future because there is no data about the future because it hasn't happened yet. So when you use the dominant model that says we can only make decisions based on rigorous data analysis, you're making an assumption about the future. And this is the assumption. The future is identical to the past. Think about it. That is the assumption. Why is that the assumption? It's because you're taking data, you're analyzing it, and you're taught in Statistics 101 that the only time, the only way in which you can make inferences from a sample of of data that you've analyzed to the universe you're looking at is if it's representative. So you can't say, I'm going to try to figure out uh, uh, what you know, people want now in their automobile, what matters to them in their automobile purchase, and then only interview men or only interview young people 
or only interview old people or only interview people on the coast. What a statistician would say is, ah, ah, that's not representative of people. That's a skewed sample. And so you cannot make any inferences about what you should do based on that skewed sample, right? So the only way that you can do analysis and make a decision on the basis of that analysis is if you are confident your, your uh, sample is representative, which means that you're implicitly assuming the future is going to be the same as the past. And how many times in business does that actually happen? Otherwise, the statisticians would say you're foolish to even analyze the data at all. So what's a better model? A better model says there are two distinctive parts of the world and they require fundamentally different decision approaches. They've been mushed together in the modern world and, and that's, a, that's a fundamental error. And this is a fundamental error that was pointed out 2,500 years ago. So it's not like this is something new. This is Aristotle, who in the fourth century BC invented science. He's the first human being to talk about how you could analyze, if you will, to uh, figure out the cause of a given effect that we see. That's what Aristotle was interested in. But he made this distinction. He said it's for the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. What did Aristotle uh, mean by that? Uh, he meant that if I take this pen uh, and I, and I uh, uh, let, <laughs> let go of it, it'll fall. fall. And it fell last week, last year, 10 years ago. It's going to fall next week, uh, 100 years uh, from now, uh, because there's this universal force called gravity that pushes everything down. So it's uh, a part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. And for that, he said, use my scientific method. Um, but he also pointed out something that is not taught <laughs> anywhere, uh, which is there's another part of the world, the part of the world where things can be other than they are. And that part of the world would be kind of represented by this, right? In 1999, how many of these were there? The answer is zero, zero smartphones, because the first one was a BlackBerry in 2000. How many are there now? 4.4 billion last time I checked the numbers. That's a part of the world where things have changed fundamentally, dramatically. Everything about the way we live now uh, has, has been made different by this thing. And what Aristotle said in that part of the world is do not use the scientific method. For that part of the world, you must imagine possibilities and choose the one uh, for which the most compelling argument can be made a completely different way of operating right, than the dominant model suggests. A completely different way of operating than the dominant model uh, suggests. It says you have to divide the world and only use analysis for one part. The modern business world is using analysis for everything. What happens if you analyze? Your assumption is the future will be uh, like the past. The reason uh, then that you do what you do is because you will do right whatever the analysis said as if the future will be identical to the past because that's how analysis works. So if you want to think about doing something new, there won't be any data for that and you won't do it. Who will do it? Two kids in a garage who you do, do not know. You don't know what they're up to, where they are, who they are. Uh, and that's the greatest fear of the modern CEO is being disrupted by a little, uh, a little company. That's not accidental. That is a, a result of our dominant model where corporations, existing corporations, especially big ones, uh, who have adopted this dominant model, convince themselves not to do new things because there isn't data to support it, which opens the field for, for little folks. And it's interesting. It is, it is, it is uh, reflected in the, the modern world of education. This is just a bugaboo of, of, of mine, which is 
people are taught the scientific method where you construct a hypothesis, a novel hypothesis, then you conduct uh, design and conduct an experiment, you analyze the data and you draw the conclusion. That's the scientific method uh, in its simplest, uh, simplest forms. There are literally thousands and thousands of PhD courses in designing and conducting experiments, how to do that, you know, how to analyze data, uh, how you can draw conclusions from data, thousands, thousands of them. I've been searching and I still haven't found a single PhD course on the face of the planet. There may be one, I'm not saying there isn't. I, I've been searching and I haven't been able to find one uh, about how you create a novel hypothesis. Right? How do you create a novel hypothesis? That's because we hit the dominant model is all about these three things and you cannot invent the future with these three things. And if you're wondering, you know, how I, how, how I spend my time thinking, thinking about this, I, I spend a lot of time uh, on, uh, on uh, paying attention to anomalies. What I think in the modern world, our dominant model has caused us to focus our gaze on the averages, the mean, the middle of the distribution, because that's what analysis says is important. It says outliers are unimportant. I believe in watching the out, uh, outliers, the anomalies, because they're the key to the future. And what I, I tell the people I work with is we all work up models that explain, like the causal model that explains the mean. Right? What I want you to focus on is a causal model that explains the anomalies. Because when you figure out what explains the anomalies, you can figure out the, the future. Um, so my core point and uh, my uh, closing thought is, I want you to take ownership of your models. If a model doesn't produce the results it, it, that you expect it to produce, don't blame it on yourself and say, I didn't do it right. I didn't use the model right. I want you to say, that model may just be deeply flawed and I'm going to think about utilizing another model. And that is what I wrote about in uh, A New Way to Think. Thank you. Now I will turn it back to you for questions, discussions, anything you got on your mind, Michael. Okay. So I get to go first, even though there's already some interesting questions coming up in the chat box that uh, we're going to post to you uh, uh, Roger. So uh, going back to the uh, view and the thought and the interesting perspective and comment about the smartphones and their penetration and the Aristotle-related questions, the scenario is that uh, uh, we had a hypothesis some time ago that said on the basis that a um, person is now with almost certainty carrying one of these devices. Yes. On the basis that that device is picked up maybe and looked at, let's just say, 200 times a day. Mm -hmm. On the basis there's a reason that the person is picking up the phone 200 times a day and some questions around why are they doing that and what are they looking for, shouldn't corporations consider having some of the real estate airspace or time space of those 200 pickups per day? And that part of that should say, that's a good idea and you're important, I see you and that they don't do that. I believe that that premise is very sound, as that that scenario should happen, and it can't unrealistic, it can realistically happen. It certainly can, from an execution standpoint, be delivered. I would present that principle and idea to people, and they would say, totally, I got it, I can buy it in. And then they would spend 
a hundred, give me a hundred reasons of just obstacles for them doing anything. Right back to the data question of like they would ask questions like, well, what's the data analyst from last year doing? I'm like, that doesn't. <laughs> whatever right so for those who are on the call that are frustrated by being in situations identically or similarly because the hypothetical is something selfishly but people can relate to their own where they're trying to get things done in the day-to-day how could they take the principles and process it and apply it for their particular situations <laughs> to work out how within the constructs of their world they must operate, you know? Sure. Well, I mean, I guess I would give give the kind of ways of discussing the dilemma with, with uh, the, the, the person who's saying, where's the data to, uh, to, to do this? I, you know, you're, you can't prove it to me. Uh, one, I would quote Charles Sanders Peirce to them, and uh, one of the greatest American pragmatist philosophers, uh, who pointed out that no new idea in the history of the world has been proven in advance analytically. So, <laughs> what bosses typically do is ask you to do something that's never been done before on the planet by anyone at anywhere. Uh, and I think it's important to a to to, to point that out. Um, but B, what I think you've got to do is learn the skill that, that you need to learn is a skill in turning the future into the past productively. So what do I mean by that? Well, from a data standpoint, the huge problem with the next six months is there's no data about the next six months today, right? That's a huge data problem about the next six months. The really good thing about the next six months from a data standpoint is in six months, it'll be in the past and there'll be oodles and oodles of data about those six months. So the trick is if you want to try something new is to be able to figure out how you can experiment in a way that isn't going to be, if it works out uh, kind of that your experiment, your, your thesis is just wrong. It's not going to be a, a you know, a, sh- a torpedo below the water line, right? But you, you do an experiment that enables you to observe data uh, in the future. And, and, what that means, though, is making a prediction, right? You say, I'm going to try this, and I predict we'll see X, right? I can't prove it. I'm just saying my thesis is that. And then if that happens, the person who previously would be totally skeptical will be saying, well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, Michael said this is what, what he believes is going to happen if we did X. It's happened. And they're on the pr- process then of building their own confidence in your idea. And that's interesting enough. I don't know if, uh, you know, if everybody in the call knows the firm IDEO, uh, which is sort of the pr- premier design firm in many p- people's views on the planet. And, and uh, the co-founders of it, uh, David Kelly, who's still with us, and Bill Mogridge, who passed, passed away, um, uh, popularized the notion of of rapid prototyping. What they said is, in order to design something new and cool, you should put out at a low cost, a low resolution prototype of it to go ask customers, users, what they think of it. Um, And then on the basis of that, improve it, take it back to them, improve it, take it back to them, et cetera, rapid iterative prototyping. That is a way of turning the future productively into the past. Uh, and I, and David Kelly is a great friend of mine. And I asked him on stage for the uh, latest book. I said, David, did you ever think, cause his reason for doing it was that's the way to use user feedback to make your product ever, your service, your offering ever better. And I said, did you ever take into consideration that while it was getting better, it was also building confidence in those who would eventually have to green light this to to be watching uh, 
users go from yeah, man, that's okay to I'm I'm liking it now to I'm loving it now to this is absolutely perfect. The person who has to write the hundred million dollar check or whatever five hundred million dollar check to put it into production is watching that and building confidence. And he said, "No, I hadn't thought of that." Uh, but to me, that's why IDEO is as is, 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 uh, uh, famous a design firm and prominent a design firm. I don't think their designers are that much better than their competitors. They just have a process that helps, helps uh, uh, somebody green light something that they would have otherwise not uh, green lit. So getting skill in that process is what you have to do to be a successful innovator rather than somebody who comes up with ideas that nobody buys. Mm. So that's a great and detailed response. And it <laughs> parlays to a question from one of the uh, attendees. Emily has written uh, this question says, um, leaders influence but don't control culture, right? Leaders influence but don't control culture. Do you believe that? And I, before answering that, so I can add just something to that, Emily, to contextualize against Rogers, your last you know, point and comment and your visibility as you are a consultant to the CEOs of many of the largest. Where does responsibility lie around the innovation for cultural, let's say, evolution or nurture or nourishment, right? So taking Emily's question, you know, where is it coming from? And particularly because I would predict a lot of the people that are on the call are, are within the HR world. Is it them? Is it someone else? Is it partnership? Is it using your model from HR to challenge leadership? I'll, I'll pass that back to you then. Sure. So I, I would say I, I uh, agree with the, the point that leaders influence but don't control culture, but they have the most important influence on, on culture. Uh, and I, I believe, and there's a chapter in the book on, on culture, but I, I believe that culture will, will uh, the dominant models for changing culture are deeply flawed. It's sort of like, we're going to, we're going to mandate a change in culture. Here's the culture we want to so now go do it and eh, never works. And another is, uh, um, formal organizational changes. We're going to change our culture to be more entrepreneurial by by flattening the uh, flattening the organization, uh, or we're going to change culture by by decentralizing. The, the, these these things these things don't don't work. Full full stop. What changes culture? Culture is shaped by the way people interact with one another in everyday work life. That is what uh, uh, shapes culture. And so if in everyday work life, bosses give orders to subordinates, and if subordinates uh, don't come back with exactly what the boss wants, the boss you know, beats the crap out of them, uh, then you'll just have a culture of, of people being scared, uh, people hiding uh, kind of errors from from bosses, uh, everything working slowly, uh, massive amounts of rework. It's all, and it doesn't matter what the, the stated culture is. It does not matter what the organizational structure is. It doesn't matter what the compensation structure is. That's the culture you'll get. Uh, if instead, you know, bosses give out instructions for their subordinates because they are the bosses where they where they where they take the time to say are you comfortable with this task do you understand it and are you comfortable with it and invite them to come back and say you know if you get stuck while doing this just come back you don't have to have the answer come back and and tell me how and why you're stuck uh and if when they come back with the with the, the answer they say well that's you know that's a if, it, if it's good enough, that's a, that's a great answer. Thank you. Pat them on the back. If it's not a good enough answer yet, say, okay, that's a good start. Uh, let's figure out how we can make this better, right? If that's the interaction one-on-one, -on -one, then you'll have a culture of more collaboration, less fear, uh, you know, getting things incrementally better, always incrementally uh, improving them and improving uh, them through working together. Who's got to start that? the CEO. Kremlin watching does not happen only in Moscow. <laughs> Kremlin ha watching happens everywhere. 
everybody watches what the most senior people in the organization do when they're doing their work and interacting with people. So I do not believe you can change culture from, uh, from HR. HR can't say, here's the culture of change. We're going to do things. Now, if you got a head of HR who can have a conversation with the CEO saying, what kind of culture you, uh, do you want, uh, Mr. or Miss CEO, uh, and, and then helps the CEO behave personally in ways that are consistent with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, that culture, then that's a really useful role that HR can, uh, can play. But they can't create a culture change. The CEO uh, has to. And it, and it goes quickly, right? Uh, I mean, give you a little example. When AG was CEO of Procter & Gamble, he had a requirement for traveling to any part of the Procter world. Somebody said, hey, man, we're opening a new factory in uh, Turkey. The, the president of the country is, is coming and we need you at the ribbon cutting ceremony. AG would say, yes, but only if while I'm in Istanbul uh, or, or uh, Ankara, um, I do an in-home visit where I sit down with a, with a, a housewife uh, to ask her, questions about how she cooks, cleans, et cetera. I have to have an in-home uh, visit and I have to, and I have to do uh, a set of store checks where I walk stores to see how products are being uh, uh, displayed. So uh, he didn't say, and I'm going to change the culture of Procter and Gamble. He just did it. So what was he trying to do? Trying to make the, make sure the, co the company is more both, and consumer centric and more customer, they call their customers, the, the, they call the trade channel uh, customers, more consumer and customer centric. But he didn't, he didn't spend his time, you know, kind of spouting that. He just did that. So what's then the, the head of Proctor Turkey supposed to do? Say, I don't want to do in-home visits because I don't have time. Oops, sorry. The guy who's running the whole company has got time for that. Every time he's on, he's on a trip. You just, you just say, and he must think it's important. And I want to be like him. I'm aspiring to be, to, uh, to be like him. And you start doing it. And then what about the people who work for the head of, uh, of, of uh, Turkey? Can they say, well, yes, my boss does that, but I'm too busy for that. No. And it just, it just changes and the culture changes, but it won't change unless, unless uh, uh, senior executives starting at the very top change their behavior. I had a call with a uh, senior executive uh, HR food service yesterday and, uh, you know, how's it going? And they're like, you know, we really need help with, um, you know, building up our culture associates at the front line, the turnover is just, you know, punishing the business all at all levels, both financially, operationally, and just nobody wants to be there because the drain of talent is just an endless turnover that there feels like there's no end inside. You know, I said, I got some solutions, et cetera, da, da, da. We should, you know, raise the flag on some of the things that we talked about. They said they're so busy just trying to fill the gap hole that they can't actually look at the solution that would stop the problem in the first place. Like, you know, who's going to who's gonna break the cycle? And, and it relates. Well, it'll be like Jim Senegal, right? The, the fantastic ex-CEO. He stepped down as CEO of, of, of Costco. He would walk the stores. Everybody in the whole of Costco knew who he was because he'd walk the stores, talk to them, ask them, you know, what, you know, what was, what was, you know, making it harder for them to, to serve customers, uh, et cetera. And, and the, the Costco culture is, is insanely good, like insanely good. Um, so anybody, anybody can do it. You just, you just have to have you have to have a view of what you want the culture to be, and then and then behave uh, accordingly. Another thing, another way of behaving uh, was, uh, was promote from within, right? You know, 
they did not go outside and hire people to be the kind of managers they promoted from within, right? That is taking actions that say, you know, you could be me, right? That, though, I that's how question. you can build it. And might relate to it, David, just to, in fairness, I um, mean, sorry, Roger, but David Engelbert asked the question and it might relate to this and you know, that, that opportunity. How long does it take to change the model? And it might be, you know, as fast as you're ready to make the change. But anyway, I'll, I want to make sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it depends on how much you're trying to, uh, to change it. Um, uh, if it's, if it's uh, you know, cultural, um, then... You know, I think it. I, I think it can take longer. Although, you know, when I went to become dean of the Rotman School of Management, it, it had a. It had what everybody th thought was a broken culture. There had been a. There had been a, a big scandal where the, the previous dean had been fired, and there were two warring camps. And I was. I was warned all about about how horrible the culture was, and we had it. We had it fixed within. I don't know, two or three years, um, and we and we had a. I mean, was it perfect? No, no organization perfect, but we had a stunningly low professorial turnover during the 15 years that I was, I was deep. like stunningly low because that's an industry where professors keep going to better and better schools. They just work their way up, not the organization because there's no organization to work up as a professor. Uh, it's, they go to better school, bigger school, bigger budget. We had stunningly low, uh, turnover, uh, and also stunningly low turnover in the, in the st staff for, for example. And, um, but it's just, it just took making sure that everything I did as, as a uh, CEO was consistent with the culture that, uh, that I wanted to see. Um, I mean, uh, Mahatma Gandhi was a, not a, not a dumb guy. Uh, you know, and he said, be the change you want to see a CEO has to be the change he or she wants to see, or don't even, uh, don't even bother starting mm. on some of these other models, right. Um, that's culture, but on some of the other models like data analytics, there you can you can make the change more quickly. Uh, the, the head of the Procter Beauty business saw uh, saw um, too much decision making in the beauty business that was based based on on uh, on only data analytics, uh, and she just said, "Unless I have quantitative." and qualitative reasoning behind decision coming forward to me, I'm not going to make it full stop. If, if I, if I get the quantitative story and you say, uh, you know, kind of Alex, uh, you got to make this d decision. Here's the data. I just refuse. That can be fast. Right now that also ends up having a culture, culture change as, as well, but that's a change from the dominant model of it's all about the data anal and data analytics. All right. In fairness, uh, we got three minutes uh, left, so let me do a bit of housekeeping, and then uh, subject to Roger, if you're available to stay on a little longer uh, for people that want to, you know, stay on and ask some questions, we'll sure. uh, we'll do that. But I just want to do some quick housekeeping for everybody. So the first thing is, uh, you know, I speak on behalf of a lot of the work proud folks, and hopefully the attendees to again thank you, uh, Roger, for. Uh, taking some time and giving us some valuable insights. I've got a lot out of it, and I've seen some nice comments in the chat associated with that, too, that, as I mentioned, we'll send out some information uh, to uh, collect address information to send out a copy of Roger's book. It won't be personally signed, but we'll get you a copy of uh, his book as, as soon as uh, uh, available. Uh, there'll be a recording of this. We'll give you copies of that, uh, et cetera, for your own reference. Uh, Roger's information is there on screen in the event that you wanted to uh, have a separate reach out to Roger. I, I can't speak to his um, in, uh, openness to that, but his contact, sure. trying to give us the contact information. I always try to be responsive. Uh, you know, uh, 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 to do that. And I'll, um, you know, I'll, I'll share one anecdotal sort of, you know, thing at the end uh, associated with some of the talks, uh, the, some of the topics today, and, you know, uh, you know, the work proud of gender is to, to go, you know, let's make people proud of their work. How do you sort of build pride? Well, You've either got intrinsic, your own personal pride, or extrinsic, that is what people would say about you. 
you know, because you're getting uh, pride from your peers or your uh, subordinates or you're from your leaders or even from your customers. You know, what you do is important, they're saying, you know, and you do it well and we appreciate, you know, you. Now, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll translate that to uh, the rabbi talking to us not, not too long ago said, uh, hey, you might not be religious, right? But look, if you just do the thing all the time, eventually you'll get into the habit of it and it'll sort of feel natural. And I don't know if she was in very, you become religious or it sort of feels more natural. You'll tend to be part of the community. Parlay that into some of the things that we're doing where people want to build company cultures where there's a lot of good feedback and energy and people can be at, inspired to give their best and you know some of the you know the comments that that david was referencing i mean roger was referencing earlier in the presentation about you know good feedback don't tread on your employees inspire their ideas and celebrate their their successes even if they're you know smaller to uh, to, to 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 bigger ones well there was a very conservative insurance company client of ours they were very skeptical about you know this premise that positive feedback can be used to you know drive business outcomes and very inexpensive way to get some business results and outcomes in terms of, you know, turnover rate, productivity, performance. Cut a long story short, they did it for a while. He became a heavy user himself. Couldn't believe the amount of positive feedback that came back from him for the recognition that he gained. He became one of the biggest advocates, uh, you know, sort of uh, of that. So uh, anyway, again, uh, so I uh, want to thank everybody. We'll close it at that point. Uh, but but if Roger, would you like to stay for a couple of minutes and share? Sure, the- sure. If there if there are questions, I'm 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 happy to. I've got I've got a little bit of time. Thank you. Right. So I'll see if anybody wants to put a question in the chat box, uh, you know, quickly as a last question for uh, uh, Roger. Otherwise, we'll 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 draw it to an an end. Uh, I see no questions. I'll give them a minute uh, if, if, if they've if they've got any any more. Um, I would just say on the proud proud fund, uh, Michael. Um, I have a view of happiness, uh, which is that there's a holy trinity of happiness. A person is happy to the extent that they're a valued member of a community, one, two, that they value, and three, is valued by people outside the community. Uh, And if a company is smart, they try to make sure that they make their employees happy uh, or contribute to their employees being happy by paying attention to those three things. Um, So, uh, you know, Superstar athletes are happy because they are a valued member of their team. They think their team is great. And uh, people outside the team think they're great. That's why they become profoundly unhappy when they retire. Right. Uh, because the, the holy trinity of happiness for them disappears all in one fell swoop. So, so I, think that, I think that relates to your, your uh, pride point. People are ha- ha- proud to the extent that they are they are a happy member of a community. Yeah, I think this, uh, you know, this quest, it's a, I think it's a, it has historically not been a priority because organisations have had other initiatives and agendas to solve and they've mechanised, you know, payroll and benefits and, and, and even training and other sort of systems. So they've sort of matured in terms of a capability standpoint at that front. That then allows for questions that we're starting to ask. And those questions pertaining to, you know, a, di- a big dimension of the employee experience, right? Not a human experience, but an employee experience. The delta or the, the consequence of an employee term is that, well, they're working, right? Well, why do we work? Well, of course, the first and foremost is the we better, you know, provide safety and the Maslow's sort of level one and level two. And after mm-hmm. that, it's like, well, because I, I like it, you know, and, well, why do you like it, you know, you ask and you sort of delve deeper and it's like, well, because it gives me satisfaction. Why does it give you satisfaction? Because I do it well. And when I do it well, it gives me satisfaction. There's the pride and why, you yeah. know, the crowd's you know, standpoint. But the other thing tying back to earlier is so it's the blind spot that's now becoming more in focus as the labour market challenges happen on one side and people are asking the questions of, like, why do I do this job versus that job? Why should I stay with this company when the one down the road gives me a little bit more? Now, what are the what are the drivers? And to your point, you know, then it's sort of the happiness where 
we're sort of spinning the, the, the adjectives. But a part that I think is really interesting and consequential for this day and age is the employees are no longer in the office. They're no longer physically contacting each other. They aren't in the same time zone. They may be in different geographies, and they certainly aren't doing nine to five anymore, like in the traditional way. In certain markets, you've got shifts, etc. So not, you know, blankly. So thus, back to you know my illustration, I'm like, you better have some stuff that's communicating and connecting because you've got this huge opportunity. You better do something with that opportunity, you know, because they, yeah. you know, they sort of need it anyway. So. Um, Anyway, I I, I, uh, uh, I really like some of your uh, you know uh, points, and again, seeing the uh, you know the comments and the feedbacks, and maybe I can follow up with you on a you know separate. Sure. Mm-hmm. I sure. think we'll 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 stop the the presentation, and thank you, you Roger, and and everybody else. Terrific! Thank you for having me. That was lots of fun.